let's, let's just illustrate how the character of our God is not a vindictive God, and we'll do it with Mark 2, okay? Now we're going to go quickly through Mark 2. There's, first of all, the event in verses 1 to 5, which is a classic. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful uh, picture. I love the story. If I get excited, sorry. Love the story. It's, it's a great story, as a story in itself. Last time, Jesus showed that the implication of the kingdom of God coming, he said the kingdom of God's coming, the implication was that people should turn from sin, repent, and put their trust in Christ alone to save them, believe. If the kingdom of God's coming and you've been out of order, if you've been in treason against the king and he's coming, best to sort it out. And Jesus says the way to sort it out is to turn from sin, trust in him, repent and believe. We're up as far as chapter 1, verse 15. And then he shows how you express that in following him. So he calls Peter and Andrew, James and John, and he says, follow me. And the implication of following him is then spelled out, and I will make you fishers of men, because he is fishing for men. He hasn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And to do that, he's fishing for men. He's not throwing thunderbolts at men. He's not being vindictive. He's saying, follow me, and I will make you too part of the game I'm in, which is, game, not the word to use, the, uh, bus the business isn't the word either, give me a word, um, endeavour, upon which I am engaged. Uh, <laughs> We've got the posh language, always the best way. Um, the implication of all of this is that I'm going to go fishing for people because I don't want them facing the judgment of God. I don't want them coming under it. That's not the act of an addictive God, is it? Okay, so he says, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And since then, Jesus has been going around doing things that have opened a pretty big window, both on who this person there to follow is and what he's got on his heart. Because what has he been doing? He's been healing a leper. He's been setting people free from the demonic stuff they got themselves trapped in healing many teaching about the kingdom of god what is the message of the kingdom of god mark tells us once he tells us at the beginning and then he just uses that sort of shorthand for it the message of the kingdom of god he spells out once at the beginning in chapter 1 verse 15 repent for the kingdom of god is at hand and he goes and calls people to follow him to express that so we've seen jesus teach in the synagogues with amazing authority and not as their teachers of the law then liberate a demonized man, healing, preaching endlessly, drawing crowds of ordinary people who totally hung on his words because he had authority in what he said and in what he did, healing the sick and setting people free and so on and so forth. Well, that doesn't sound like a vindictive God. You could easily object, of course. It doesn't necessarily sound like a God to you at all. Until we come to the passage we're dealing with today in chapter 2 where Jesus makes that claim specifically and backs it up. Let's settle he's being kind, not vindictive, and see what he's been claiming, and then see if that claim is justified. Jesus on a house at Capernaum. After some days, when he returned to Capernaum, the news spread that he was at home. And so many gathered, there was no longer any room, not even by the door, and he preached the word to them. They were thronging to hear him preach the word to them. That's his priority. The verbal proclamation of the kingdom of God is the way that the kingdom of God is advanced on earth. Primarily. And he supports that. His authority supports that both in word and in deed. Capernaum then, yes, it was his hometown, on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. He, he was from Nazareth, but Capernaum was a thriving, bustling urban center. You know, a thriving fishing industry. It had a big export trade in fish. I know it doesn't sound, you know, doesn't sound great, does it, uh, to us? It doesn't sound like a bit of a goer. But it was a thriving, buzzing region economically, major trade centre in northern Galilee. And Jesus seems to have spent a good deal of his growing up time at Capernaum. Bustling, prosperous sort of place. Jesus was, inverted commas, at home there. We don't know if it was his family home on the day, whether some commentators suggest it was Peter's home. It does actually say he came home. And it talks about the home he was in, so... Balanced judgment, I'd say, well, maybe it's his own house and maybe his mum isn't going to be pleased about what happens to the roof. But that's mothers for you. They just tell inexplicable stuff. People were fascinated with Jesus and he's back from his preaching trip around the villages of Galilee that began in chapter 1, verse 38. And now he's back, he becomes the focus of attention and attraction in Capernaum again and people flock to the house where he is. Hardly what you get with a vindictive God, is it? People flocking to him more running from him, one would have thought. Now the first century houses have been excavated in Capernaum, plenty of them, along with the synagogue at Capernaum. They're not exactly large. 
So you can go through the archaeology reports of all this, and I could give you the references. Houses were about, well, the ones we've got, these houses were no more than about five metres across. And it looks as if they were limited as to how long they could be because of the length of tree trunks available for roofing. Okay? So we know we can span 21 foot, basically, and the medievalists in this country knew you can span 21 foot with a wooden beam because of the density of timber and the strength of it, flexural strength and so on. So we know we can go about 21 foot. Go up to Tally Abbey, walk about, and there you will have pillars to hold the beams at 21 foot intervals. Okay? Because it's a known thing. In their, in their time, it wasn't the strength of the timber that was available so much as the length of tree trunks that were available for roofing because it was scrubby earth, apparently. The roof on this place was flat. Well, it's got to be, hasn't it? We know that. Accessed by a small staircase on the outside. Small but sturdy enough to use for working on and for sleeping on, which is great, really, because all they had was wooden beams and branches thatched with rushes daubed with earth, which would bake in the sun. So it's like an adobe roof, if you see what I mean. A cast floor, but an adobe type of roof. Serviceable load-bearing surface, but we're running ahead a little bit. What we've got Mark describing for us here is a scene rather like a Welsh funeral. Now, you've been to a big Welsh funeral? They happen in little chapels in the back of nowhere, right? I seen one not that long ago, as you know, earlier in the year. And, and somebody's well-known, well-known family, whatever. The little chapel will be flooded with people, all jammed in, sitting like this, jammed up tight. And, and it will overflow out through the, uh, the, the aisles and out into the porch, from the porch into the doorway, and from the doorway out into the little graveyard, and from there through the gate and onto the road. And people are all just pressing to get to hear as best they can what's going on inside. That's what you've got. Except it wasn't a funeral. Jesus had come home. The house is small. The people crowd its door. They're unutterably keen to be near, be near Jesus, as you wouldn't normally expect with a vindictive person. And there's therefore no chance of getting in there with a stretcher. And Jesus preached the word of God to them, and that's what they come for. We know the content of that word. We know what it's about. So there's a disabled man, a man who was disabled, and his friends hear that Jesus is back, and they've heard what's been happening, and hope stirs in their hearts for their friend. Wouldn't be easy, but it was a no-brainer. They brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus, which, of course, you wouldn't do if you thought Jesus was vindictive. But it's the logical thing in the circumstances because Jesus has been demonstrating divine authority in his teaching, his healing. Their friend's life is going to go on being rubbish unless Jesus can do something for him because there was no NHS anyway. So they stick him on his crabaton. The colloquial term, not for a mat, but for a simple poor person's bed. And the four guys take a corner each, they pick up the bed and they take him to Jesus. Can you imagine? What a picture. What a picture. Because the house is full. That's blown it. Can't get him in. And no one lets them pass through the throng in the street, crowded around, trying to get in by the door. Because they want to hear Jesus. But they're not going to be thwarted by that. So it's up the stairs at the side of the house, which nobody's thought of. The stairs to the side. Up the stairs to the side of the house, with that basic bed. Hey, steady. You know... Try getting somebody who's sort of laying paralytic on a bed up, you know, you know, <laughs> can you imagine getting Mike up the steps? Bonkers. Madness. Yeah, we go for that. Four, four big lads. Up he goes. Shut up. Stop wriggling. And up he goes, up the steps, onto the flat roof. And the guy in the bed's lying there thinking, what are you going to do now? <laughs> Have you got friends like that? What are you going to do next? On this flat earth, branch and tree trunk construction of the roof. And Mark uses a sentence that's strange in the Greek. He says they unroofed the roof above Jesus. They unroofed the roof. They unroofed the roof. And to that, Mark adds exoruxantes, literally digging it out. They dug at the, you've seen this, I've told you the construction of the roof. They, like, we're going to dig it out now, boys. Oh, bonkers. And they dug out earth and branches and breams to create a hole above Jesus. They'd be banging, then they'd be cracking, and there'd be dust falling, and then there'd be daylight. And into the daylight comes a camp bed getting lowered down with somebody on it, right down on top of the preacher. Fantastic. Don't you want to be there? I so want to be there. 
That is amazing. You don't do that if he's a vindictive person. R.T. France, in his, R.T. France, Dick France, lectured me when I was at Bible College. He was a leading Anglican commentator, and he went on to an Anglican college after finishing with us. I hope he finished with us, not we finished him. He says, in his balanced Anglican way, he says, their desperate desire to get their friend to the one person who could help him is more important than either the awkwardness of the narrative situation, explaining what you're doing, or the damage to the property. They dug a hole right through somebody's roof to get their friend to Jesus in his desperate need. It's not a matter of slipping off a few slates. They made a mess. You don't do that with a person who's vindictive. And when they did so, when they did that, you know something's really odd? No one, no one mentioned the state they'd made of the roof. Wasn't the big thing. Nobody said a word. Except Jesus. And what Jesus said was, Son, your sins are forgiven. He wasn't talking about the roof. Son. Not a very common form of address at all. In the Gospels, outside physical fatherhood, it's used only once when Jesus addresses his disciples. Son, and who would have thought sin and its forgiveness was going to be the next big issue? Disability rights are surely the issue. The state of the NHS, surely that's the issue. Isn't it? Friendship, maybe that could be the issue. No. Jesus turns to him and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. He hadn't come with his sins. He'd come with his dodgy legs. Now, now please notice, this announcement doesn't take place in a vacuum. Let's get this out of the way first. It takes place when Jesus sees their faith. Their faith. It is plural. It's their faith. Not just his. Fascinating. Jesus sees their faith. Faith in Mark's Gospel unleashes outstanding power from God. No question. And it isn't just his faith, the crippled man's faith. It is their faith. And it is in response to faith that Jesus heals in Mark's Gospel. Chapter 5, verse 34 and verse 36. Chapter 9, verses 23 to 4. Chapter 10, verse 52. Faith leads to, to, to that. And its absence either leads to the rebuke of people who are nonetheless delivered, as in chapter 4, 40, or an actual limitation on his miracle-working activity. Chapter 6, 5 to 6. People in the synagogue at Nazareth. Please note, the faith here is not verbal. It's active. They made a stomping great hole in the roof and they dropped him through. I mean, they must have been tired already because they've been carrying him on his bed. And they got him up the stairs. So, so why the mention of sin in this context? How harsh is that? To raise with a man so afflicted, your sin... Well, hang on, what's the relationship of suffering to sin? Where does suffering come from? Sin. Got to be careful. Got to be careful what we are saying and what we aren't. In the Old Testament, physical healing is very clearly related, very closely, to forgiveness of sins. So, 2 Chronicles 7, 13 to 14, Isaiah 38, 16 to 17. There's this close link between healing and forgiveness of sins being pronounced for people. And just as physical suffering can be uh, caused by the sin of the sufferer or even sin of the community, well you get that in the Old Testament. I can give you a list of verses for it. But Dick France again, bless him, as balanced an Anglican as ever, that suffering is the result of sin in the general sense that the world's evils are traced back to the fall would have to be generally agreed. That's what you said straight away. The suffering in the world is traced back in general terms back to the coming of sin into the world and causing chaos in the cosmos. But the book of Job, he says, 
testifies to a strong reaction against the view that the suffering of an individual must necessarily be the result of his or, sin, his or her sin. I haven't got tutti because I was a bad boy yesterday. I say I could, couldn't I? I could have overdone it on the sweeties. You know, I mean I could have done, but it doesn't necessarily say so. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It could be that my affliction, my suffering, my pain is caused because of my sin, but it could simply arise out of the general messed upness of the creation because of our rebellion against our creator. We've got to hold on to that. That's, in, that's extremely important. What happens here is more than that. Because Jesus says to him, on his own authority, your sins are forgiven. In the Old Testament, a prophet, an Old Testament prophet, might, might announce, announce God's forgiveness of sin. As, say, uh, you know, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin and you are not going to die. Samuel didn't say, I forgive you, you're not going to die. Jesus did. Jesus is claiming to forgive sin himself. And there's the difference. It's a difference that, that exists in what he says, and he's going to be charged with claiming to do exactly that which only God can do. And then he's going to go on and make his claim specifically to divinity because he said that. Jesus is saying, I'm God, I can forgive your sins, I'm forgiving your sins. There you go, get up your mat and go. Make sense? Jesus is saying what only God can say. And of course, the theologians have come to the house. The theologians are in the house. Verses 6 to 7, there's an objection. Some of the experts in the law, scribes in the old way of translating it, some of the experts in the law were sitting there turning these things over in their minds. You know how that works? Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Correct. The scribes are sitting in the audience. A.W. Tozer says, You can be straight as a gun barrel theologically and as empty as one spiritually. How good is that? That's good, isn't it? You can be as straight as a gun barrel theologically and as empty as one spiritually. That's exactly where these fellows are, of course. And Jesus just spoke about the forgiveness of sin. He just spoke the forgiveness of a person's sin. And of course the scribe's assumption is correct. It is just their analysis of the person and the character of Christ that is lacking. And that's where they go wrong. So it is for so many today. So is Jesus. Let's be clear about the seriousness of the accusation. This in God is remarkably serious in that culture. Blasphemy is a capital offence because it could lead the people of Israel astray. And that would be more serious than people seem to realize. Leviticus 24, blasphemy is a capital offense. And let's not forget that in three years on from this event, potentially from that point, that is the charge that ultimately brings Christ to Calvary and to brutal crucifixion. The charge of blasphemy. The accusation is incredibly serious but they're charging God in the flesh here with blasphemy you know way back we talked about the basic outline of, of Mark's gospel we'll do another of those for the next section before we start on it and uh, we said that in this section in this act if you like of Mark's gospel there comes a point where Jesus is doing all these things and there's no opposition and then there comes a point where opposition starts to his doing all these things this is the point the point where Jesus forgives a person's sin there would be no opposition till now. Now it's going to start. And it begins where Christ claims God's authority and it starts when he shows that he is God. And this idea of a religious opposition to Jesus becomes a the theme of so much of the following section. And Jesus replies to their accusation of blasphemy. An accusation they haven't voiced but which is going around in their heads. And Jesus, being who he is, knows what's happening. He knew what was going round in their minds. But that awareness still doesn't make him vindictive. They're, they're thinking, blasphemy, death of it, death of the capital offence, death sentence. Still not going to be vindictive. A vindictive God would have reached for the thunderbolts. 
But Jesus reasoned with them. Why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take up your stretcher and walk? What's all this stuff about easier? What's going on here, using an unusual word for easier, is called an a fortiori argument. The rabbis had a particular familiar logical device called kal wahomer, and it goes like this. If the more difficult seeming thing can be achieved, that guarantees the validity of the claim to do the easier thing. So, the simpler seeming thing, saying your sins are forgiven, is proved when the harder looking thing, getting the cripple walking, carrying his own bed, is achieved before their very eyes. Does that make sense? A visible healing is hard evidence, much easier to see than the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is saying, it seems hard to, to you to be able to do this with this guy than to say your sins are forgiven. Well, I'm going to prove it to you. There's a formal device going on. There's something they'll recognize from their own scribal debates and arguments about the law. And Jesus goes straight into something they'll grasp, something they'll understand, he uses a format that is from them and their culture and their understanding. And he says, I'm going to prove to you I can forgive sins so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Get up, pick up your thing, go home. It's going to look really rough if, uh, if the guy can't actually move a muscle now, isn't it? I tell you, stand up, take your crabaton, and go home. Just so that you will know, you will all know, that the Son of Man has authority. That's been the issue for the preceding chapters. His authority in word and deed has authority to forgive sins, which is the key issue that I'm talking about in the preaching of the kingdom. Get up, walk. Take your stretcher, go home. And immediately the man stood up, took his stretcher, went out in front of them all. They were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. No, you haven't. You certainly have not. Jesus had said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. See that? It's the Son of Man. He's saying, I am the Son of Man of Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I am the one who enters into the throne room of God in heaven and is invited to sit on the throne as co-regent with God to rule in the world he has made, to exercise authority over creation. That's what happens in Daniel 7. To rule over all the world. And just so that you will know that I am he, get up and walk. Take your bed and go home. And it happens before their very eyes. He uses that authority that he has on earth. Not to be vindictive, but to forgive people's sin and prove it by healing the cripple. And then the guy got up. Hadn't done that before. And he went home under his own steam. He certainly hadn't done that before. And he went home carrying the bed they brought him on. And that's just mind-blowing after a life of disability. Therefore Jesus is God in the flesh. But the scribes went out into opposition against Jesus. And there's the point. Can you or can you not live with the truth about Jesus? Because they decided they couldn't. They had too much to lose. The people all glorified God. What's happening here doesn't sound like the act of a vindictive God, does it? He's on a mission to heal the sick and teach wisdom so that people can live their difficult lives and far from lobbing thunderbolts, the act of omnipotent vindictiveness, gently backs his powerful claim, his powerful claim to divinity, forgiving sin, not avenging it. Healing the sick of sin, not condemning them. because he is soaking up God's righteous wrath in himself. That's at the heart of his mission. 
The earlier judgment on sin is required by the justice of God. It continues to be unreasonable given the pain that sin causes in creation. But the merciful God pays himself even for that. So he can say to somebody who is a sinner, Son, your sins are forgiven. And prove that it works. As the guy stands up, picks up his bed, carries it home. That really isn't the act of an indicative God. That's the act of the God of mercy and love and grace. And calling him otherwise is actually quite scandalous. 